But today we are very pleased uh, to have Christian uh, bringing the word uh, for us. Um, he's an amazing brother. Please come up, Chris. Um, he's an amazing brother. Loves, loves, loves the Lord. Uh, he's a real inspiration uh, to me personally. And um, yeah, so I would just like to pray for Chris. Uh, Father God, I want to thank you for my brother Chris. Lord, thank you for his blood, uh, for your, for his um, his love and his his commitment to you. I want to ask Lord that you will bless him with your Spirit, Lord. And um, yeah, your words will truly be spoken uh, through him. Yeah, and that your spirit, Lord, will, will work miracles uh, through uh, through what he says. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sorrow to uh, open for us. Thank you that we can sit here today in your house. 
house of worship. Lord, thank you for these songs that we could sing, Lord. Lord, we pray as we sang earlier, Lord, that you will minister into our hearts, Lord. Lord, because we need you. Lord, we want to pray this morning, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will not give up on us, Lord. Lord, please keep molding us and working on us, Lord. Lord, we want to pray for each of our friends and family and church members that can't be here today, Lord. We want to pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord, that haven't come to you yet, Lord. Lord, we really want to lift them up to you this morning, Lord. We pray that you'll soften their hearts. We pray that they come to the realization, Lord, that you are the one and only true God. Lord, we want to pray that you use your words in your Bible, Lord, today mightily, Lord. Lord, help us to see what it is you want us to see. Help us to hear what it is that you want us to hear. We ask that in your mighty name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Sure. just want to say a nice warm welcome to everyone visiting as well. And um, to also to those that will be watching this that can't be here. Um, wow. When last did you hear that word in the church? I feel so invigorated to be in a place like this where week after week we get to learn so much from the Word. You know, you, you go through a chapter and it gets dissected and it's just unbelievable how much you, you learn and um, that's just truly my, my wish for all of you. Um, now you're probably asking, like uh, Sarah said, why are we doing talent suddenly? We were busy in Daniel last week. Um, but it, it's, it's quite nice, this piece, because it fits in. In Daniel, we're obviously going to go and look at Jesus' first coming. And then later on, we'll get some revelation on his second coming. And this fits in quite nicely, this particular story. And I'll explain that in a minute. And right now, we're also obviously lucky to live right smack bang in the middle of that, right? We live after the ascension. We got to remember that or celebrate that three days ago. What a special event. And... Um, I don't know about you guys, but it feels like we are in end times. You know, you look around, nobody two and a half years ago would have thought we would have gone through a, through a pandemic. We're now looking at wars in the world again, and it just it truly feels like, you know, the days of Noah just seems to get worse and worse. But before we dive into this parable, I just wanted to explore a little bit about why did Jesus speak in parables? I asked myself that question as I was studying. Now, there's actually 39 parables recorded in the four Gospels alone. So Jesus spoke in a lot of parables. Um, in Matthew 13, for those of you who want to turn there, we find out why Jesus spoke in so many parables. So Matthew 13, verse 10, His disciples came to Him and asked, why do you speak to people in parables? He answers them in verse 10 and 11. Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an, an, an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Through seeing, they do not see. Through hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. So there's four things to consider when you're reading a parable. First of all, Jesus says here, it explains the secrets of the kingdom. The second thing we're going to learn is that God's kingdom looks very different to the world's kingdom. It's kind of upside down, right? In God's kingdom, He requires us to make a decision. And another thing we're going to look at is in all parables, we always look for Jesus, as we do in all scripture. So, in the next part of the sermon, I'd like to go through these four points before we dig into the, uh, the piece. Now, in Matthew 13, verse 11, we read that Jesus gives us the knowledge. In other words, he will explain the secrets of the kingdom. Now the word secret 
is plural, right? It's secrets, there's more than one. Two examples of these secrets we can find in another parable in, in Matthew 13, further on. It's the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. The mustard seed being the kingdom of heaven, growing from small beginnings into a tree where birds come and perch in its branches. And it explains how through the Holy Spirit the church of Acts grew from a small number of people up in that upper room. And today we're millions of believers. The yeast proving that once the natural process of the growth has begun, the outcome is inevitable. It shows how a small amount of faith can make a huge impact for all of us. That seemingly insignificant amount of faith. Now in these examples, the power of the Holy Spirit is revealed to us. So we're looking at this, the second footnote I've made here, God's upside down kingdom. So I read in Matthew 20, we find that parables of the workers in the vineyard. Obviously we live in between a lot of vineyards, so I thought it just. This parable reads about the workers who are hired in the morning, and then some are hired midday, and some are hired at the end of the day. But when it came to pay them, they all got paid the same wage. Now that's completely upside down in terms of our world. If you did half a day's work, you expected to probably get less than a guy that did a full day's work. And we're not even talking about overtime yet. <laughs> so, what do we learn from this? What does it teach us? People who came into Christianity later in their lives will still be given the same reward. Entry, entry into the kingdom of heaven for everyone and for, for us will be for those who are faithful at whatever time in their lives. That secret is revealed to us here and that's a, that parable shows us that God saves by grace and not by worthiness. It's not how long you've worked for it, what you've done for it, how many hours or years you've put in. If you want to learn more, the parable of the lost sheep is obviously the same. Um, Luke 15. That parable doesn't make any sense neither. Why would you leave 99 sheep to go look for one? Risk the lives of 99. Or why would you sacrifice 99 of your workers for, for one in a, in a bigger picture of, of the world? The third point I was looking at is God requires a decision from us. What does it mean? Um, I found an example of this in Matthew 21, another parable, the parable of a landowner. Again, I went for vineyard. Landowner that planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, put the security fences up, as you do. Um, then he rented it out to some tenants. Now, when it was time to harvest, he sent three tenants, I don't know if you remember, he sent three tenants to go and collect. They got beaten up, killed and stoned. He then sends more servants, and those tenants of the land that he rented out did the same. Finally, at the end, you remember, he sends his son, which they kill because they believe they're going to inherit this place if they kill the son, because they don't land and they don't have anyone to give it to. So Jesus says, he asks in Matthew 21, he says, Jesus asked the people around him, what will the landowner do to these servants? They reply, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and rent the vineyard to other tenants. Now we know that's not what happens. Jesus said to them, have you ever read the scriptures? He quotes Isaiah 28, 16. A costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken from you and will be given to the people who will produce its fruit. Now Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees here and to some of the other religious and self-righteous and he was trying to show them something we know that Jesus is the only way. We don't understand why Jesus had to be killed, but he had to, and that is the only way. The fourth thing I mentioned is that in all the parables we look for Jesus. Like I said, in all scripture, we look for Jesus. 
Now these parables are 2,000 years old and they're still full of new surprises. And today I hopefully hope that uh, you will discover a new and fresh revelance of Jesus' words. I specifically wanted to pick something that we could read together that was Jesus' words. Jesus said this. This was recorded by one of his disciples. And I think those of you who are watching the Chosen series as well at the moment, it's just putting a lot of sort of authenticity onto the realness of it. Jesus was here on earth. He told these parables for real. He himself was within scripture. Okay, so strap in. Um, we've got two choices now. We can either go home, I'll just quickly go through these four points again, and then you can go and do the study yourself. Or uh, we can plow through together and we'll, uh, we'll pull this parable apart a little bit. Okay, so see if I can read as nice as, uh, as Sarah. So I specifically asked Sarah to read from the New King James Version. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for that. I, th I think in some of your translations, like for example in mine, it actually talks about the parable of the bags of gold. And it's also sort of smack bang in between the parable of the ten virgins and then end of times sheep and goats, which we're actually going to tackle a bit with uh, Daniel 2. Now the last time I think we did any parable in Calvary, we actually did do the parable of the ten virgins. I think it was about two years ago, maybe a little bit more. There might even be a recording of that. So we've actually done the parable of the ten virgins. And this slots in quite nicely. Um, so I'm just going to read verse 14 and 15 again for us, but from the NIV. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Now, I don't know about you, but hang on a minute. This very early, Jesus is pointing out to us here that he is that man going on. A little bit of an interesting footnote that I found. So when Jesus shared this parable, he shared this parable, the scholars say, on the Mount of Olives. He was on the Mount of Olives when he shared this parable. Exactly the same place where he ascended from. How cool is that? Now, who are the servants? I believe the servants are you and me. The servants belong to the Master. So he's talking about the believers here. He's not talking about the unsaved here. He's talking about the believers, he's talking about his servants, his people. Now, in Greek, that word is um, dolos. Now, that actually means born bondsman or slave. And we know that Paul also talks about being a bond slave. So, to put things in perspective, these weren't random people or uh, just a few that he picked. These were people that were his people. Like we are God's people. We also read here that he entrusted his wealth. So Jesus has left. He's preparing a place for us, for you and me. It's pretty exciting. He's left, but he's entrusting us with his kingdom here on earth. Sure. Let's read from verse 16. The man who had received five bags of gold, went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who received one bag went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you have entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. I'm going to stop there for a second. I've got to confess, the first time I heard this story, and that's the reason I wanted Cyril to read it from a talent perspective, as a kid or a sort of young teenager, much older than you, growing up in South Africa, I immediately thought this is quite an unfair story. Um, you know, even recently I found some parables quite difficult to grasp or even understand. Hence why I think I had to make up those first four points, kind of for myself, you know, how do you look at parables? Because I thought, okay, one guy gets five talents. So what does that mean? He's fast, he's strong, he's great at rugby, <laughs> everyone likes him, uh, teacher's favorite, probably gets a scholarship, where am I now, six? He, uh, he's probably from rich parents, right? So in my mind, I had this picture, yeah, one guy gets five talents. Um, for the girls, it would be the same, you know, they're the girls that become the prefix, or they get those badges that says they're most likely to succeed, or whatever. Now, like most of us, I probably sided a little bit more with servant number two, you know? As a boy or a girl, you get like, you know, two talents, pretty good. Maybe you're good at woodwork, or, or home economics, or uh, build a mean, you know, Rust recipe, play the piano, maybe you're a decent Elvis impersonator. Um, it's a wonderful movie. <laughs> but then we look at the last guy, and he gets his one talent taken away. You know, poor guy, typical of life, you know, so unfair. I, and then the talent gets given to Mr. and Mrs. Heptathlete, you know. The one that has the ten talents already, as if a triathlon is not enough. I remember my Sunday school teacher, with actually on the on those blackboards, she actually put up bless her, use it or lose it, and that was the kind of message that I got. That's that's what I thought. You know. um, I've got to quote this one: the best footballer in the world. This is what he said. He says. Talent without working hard is nothing. Cristiano Ronaldo is it? Talent without working hard is nothing. Now, we missed the point of the story completely here. My Sunday school teacher, as well as the football player, that's not the importance of what Jesus is actually trying to show us. So, let's, let's just look at Matthew 13 again. Verse 14, where Jesus says, He speaks in parables to fulfill scripture. It's wonderful. We'll see a lot of that in Daniel 2 when we do Daniel. Daniel will obviously make us see how much scripture has already been fulfilled. Now, I read from the NIV translation, and I got Sorrel to read from the New King James Version because in the New King James we're talking about talents which has one sort of understanding, or brings one sort of understanding with it. And in my NIV that I just read, suddenly the word talent is replaced with bags of gold. So then I wondered why, why change it? Because now I'm wrongly thinking of my, about money. You know, some people have a lot, or they get born into a lot. They seem to generate a lot of money. Now, now you know, I've got this the wrong way around again, because now we're looking at bags of gold. Now, just to explain where this came from, the English word talent actually comes exactly from the Greek word talenton or talento. Now, to make matters even more confusing, a talenton or a talento was a large amount of money. So, it was a scale and balance kind of job, you know, those big scales, and then you would put 26 kilograms of pure silver on the one end of the scale. That would give you one talent. Um, to put it in a monetary perspective, so 
In those days, a laborer would get one denarii as a wage. That would be your daily wage, would be one denarii. And to explain what this talent was in terms of its full scale value, is that talent would have been worth about 6,000 denarii. Where's Christian? So if you do the math, 6,000 denarii, we'd say you work 300 days a year, roughly, maybe a bit less. That would give you 20 years worth of wages. So that's the worth of this. I think some of the Bibles, maybe the ESV, actually has a footnote at the bottom where it says, Mine doesn't have it, but it says that this is about 20 years worth of a laborer's wage. So to put perspective on this talent, whichever way you look at it, you know, your God-given talent, you could earn a wage from that 20 years worth or more. It says it here, if it was the weight of gold or a bag of gold, as it says in mine, that they were entrusted with, this is a lot of work. It's not a small thing. So let's apply this to God's upside down kingdom then. Because we're now thinking of it as money, we're thinking of, of it as rich and poor, but we're realizing that it's not that little or insignificant amount. But Jesus did say in Luke 6 verse 20, we all know this, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So this can't be about money. Come to think of it, I love it when people used to say he's got a real God-given talent. I think commentators have stopped using that now. People now say oh, he's got a natural talent. He's got a great natural ability. But I think God-given talent, saying that, we're onto something. It also says in my Bible that they, he entrusted his wealth to them. And reading in the uh, ESV, that's why it's always so nice to look at different strong translations. They say he entrusted his property to them, as I mentioned before. But the thing to point out here is this was not the slaves in the first place. So this man, we now believe is Jesus. So this rich man, some people say this master, he's going away. He's entrusting them with what's his. Just like God is giving to us by his grace, he's entrusting us. Now they knew that the master will return. I think the lesson there is we also obviously know that Jesus is, is going to return. So we can agree that these talents are God-given talents. We can even look at it and say that it could be God-given spiritual gifts to his church, to his servants, to his believers, because we know it's his people, it's his believers. We're talking about Jesus' people here. Now, what was one of the very important things Jesus told his disciples before he ascended from the Mount of Olives? So Thursday we were celebrating Ascension Day, and um, Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 4 on the Mount of Olives, Olives as we uh, found out, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, the gift we know to be the Holy Spirit. And what was the one thing he told them to do with this gift? We read in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, we all know. He tells his now 11 disciples that once he is gone, he says in verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now let's just look at that word, entrust again. If somebody entrusts you with their property, let's say for example, a friend of yours is going away and he gives you his car while he's away or he gives you the use of his house. Now, you probably want to obey their rules, right? You wouldn't want to do nothing. I mean, let's say for example, he even gave you, in this case, some money to look after it. So you would definitely not let it go to ruin or neglect. You're going to check the oil, you're going to check the, the tires, um, if it's a house, you won't let the, you know, the place fall apart. He entrusts you with it. So, I'm starting to understand why he's calling that last servant wicked and lazy. Because what did he do? He just did nothing. He just sat in the house, let's say he's looking after my house. 
the plants are dead. <laughs> because the swimming pool is green. The dog is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> you know, I'm starting to realize, hang on a minute. That's what's going on here. No wonder you're calling him wicked at night. Quick funny story, I sent um, a couple of you this morning the, the picture. I wanted to pick a, put a slide up. We're in the Rembrandt Mall. Rembrandt's a great painter. We've got a lot of talented painters in this place. We've got a lot of talented people in general in, in this building. And I wanted to put a picture up of, uh, of Rembrandt's painting of this parable. I think I sent it to a few of you this morning. Um, now, the funny thing is, He's, he's famous for a lot of edging and print work, and obviously, do a bit of printing myself. But you look at this line drawing of the parable, and you've got the master sitting in the middle, and then to his left, if you look at the picture, he's got his accountant, and then to the right, Rembrandt has drawn, drawn the servant with his hand in his pocket, sort of looking down. Now, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to meet Rembrandt and ask him, but I'm not sure if he had a great understanding of this parable neither, because obviously he's, he's drawing a man that has one coin in his pocket. But then if you look at it in a bit of detail, you can see that that particular man looks quite shameful. He's not, he's not very happy. He's obviously being told off. Um, but maybe we can give Rembrandt a bit more, more credit. Now, Another interesting fact, I'm just going to read verse 27 again. So it says here, Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. I found that quite interesting, so I went to dig around a little bit. And the Israelites were not allowed to, to charge anyone interest. We read in a lot of the places in the Old Testament, Leviticus, the Tenomini, you actually wrote down, Deuteronomy 23 verse 19 Do not charge a fellow Israelite interest whether on money or food or anything else that they may earn interest. Verse 20 You may charge a foreigner interest but not a fellow Israelite so that the Lord your God may bless you in something you put your hand to in the land you enter so in the, into the land you are entering to possess. Now some commentaries I read suggested that this was put in there as a reminder that our talents or gifts are to be used to reach Gentiles and foreigners because you could earn interest if you were to you know, share or reach out to a, to a Gentile as it states there. And that kind of links in with the Great Commission. But then other commentaries say that it was already common practice in those days to trade or to put money in, in, in the bank um, and to earn interest. So anyway, the point is the worst thing you could do is to hide the talent. You could have, there was other, there, there's obviously other options and there's other options for us. To hide your talent or to do nothing with your talent, your God-given talent, that's not what Jesus has in mind for us. Now there are two other things that, that that I come to understand is this last servant or slave, he saw the master very different to the first two, doesn't he? Because the first two, they immediately go about to do something. But he somehow believes the master to be hard. It kind of almost reads like he's blaming the master for the fact that he didn't do anything. So it feels like he's, he's putting the blame back on, on God. And I think it made me think that a lot of us do that. I think I myself have done that, where you, you know, due to lack of effort or due to circumstance or timetable or lack of ability, you know, oh, oh, I can't do it, God. You know, or uh, what time was that prayer meeting in Venice? A bit earlier. It's, it's, it's hiding, it's hiding that talent. He didn't realize that hiding his talent did not produce faith. It has the opposite effect. The second thing I came to realize is this is not a collective effort. You know, as a family or a group together or a church body. Because they did pretty well if it's a collective effort. There's three of them. The master gives them eight bags of gold or eight talents. One gets five, one gets two, one gets one. So they've got eight. When he returns, 
There's 15 in total. It's pretty good. So as a collective effort, they did pretty, pretty well. But it's not a collective effort, is it? Just like in the parable of the ten virgins before this, each person is accountable for his or her own actions, for his or her own walk with Christ or relationship. It's not mom or dad, it's not wife, partner. The Holy Spirit filling up the oil in your lamp so you can shine your light and not hide it. Only you can buy oil for that lamp. Only you can choose what you do with your talents or your gifts. You're going to multiply them or bury them. Now saying that, there are loads of examples in the Bible, old and new, where the Holy Spirit gave talents and gifts. You guys remember we spent, what is it, 10 years in Exodus. Um, and I was reading from Exodus 35 again, where God fills that one man called Bezalel, remember? Um, he fills him with the power of the Spirit, and then he gives him the ability to do all sorts of artistic work. He ends up, you know, doing the, the outer garments, the holy tent, etc., etc. Last week we read in Daniel 4, um, King Nebuchadnezzar realized that the Spirit of God was in Daniel. I mean, Daniel was already a clever guy, and he becomes vegan, and he becomes the cleverest guy in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> we, we know that, um, that the Spirit of God was in Daniel. We know that he was a man of, of faith. He was a man that spent time in prayer. He was a man that pursue the things of God. Now he was devoted. In the New Testament, I love it when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4 and 5, he writes, my message, Paul's message, and my preaching were not wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that when your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Our faith is not on human wisdom. We love sometimes listening to these TV evangelists and sometimes some of our Bible nerds we like listening to the old sermons of like, you know, a Spurgeon or whoever and you like halfway through you fall asleep. Yeah. The voice is so monotonous. But it's not the man, is it? It's because the Word is alive. It's because the Holy Spirit is ministering to us. Because the Holy Spirit is, is going to work in us. Okay, just to recap then. So we all get given talents. We all get given talents or gifts by the grace of God. No one gets nothing of these spiritual gifts. We read further in Corinthians uh, in, in chapter 12, verse 4 to 10. You can go read that at your own time if you want, where he talks about spiritual gifts. If you want to make a note, so that's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 10. We don't get given spiritual gifts for our own benefit. They get given to us to glorify and serve God and His kingdom. These slaves weren't given the talents for their own benefit. The master was coming back. In Romans 12 verse 6, I'll read this one for us. We have different gifts according to grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. To encourage, give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generally, generously. Thirdly, we have the free will to decide what we want to do. We have the free will to decide if we want to bury our talents. Fourthly, God, we can see here, rewards faithfulness. We look at um, verse 20 where he says, We trusted the, the, the servant with five bags of gold, with five talents. And this master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
That's what I want for all of us, that we can one day come into that kingdom and share the master happiness. I'm going to read the last uh, couple of verses for us. So I'm at verse 28. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Now Jesus is not trying to tell us in this parable here that we are saved by our works. He, he gives first, because he's saying, first we receive his grace that is free to us. We do not deserve this gift of grace, but we then apply that through faith, which is the means by which we receive this gift of salvation. I'm talking about the end times. Eh? For it is by, in Ephesians 2 verse 8, that says it so much better. I'll read that. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by works so that we can boast. It's not about what we do. It's about, it's about the fact that we believe, we have faith. We want to strive to get to know Jesus. We want to work. We don't want to do nothing. But yet it is by His grace that we're saved. It goes on in, in um, the next parable where it talks about the sheep and goats and I remember reading on in it where it says in verse 37, the righteous will answer him, Lord, we did, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes to clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison to go visit you? King will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of those least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So in closing, I want to go to the communion table with you guys. If you today have doubts or a lack of faith, or you want the Holy Spirit just to come and fill you afresh again, going to read Luke 11, 13 for us. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask it? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Thank you that we can bring everything to your feet, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you taught us how to pray. That you've taught us to pray the words, may your kingdom come. Lord, help us to understand that, Lord. Lord, you've prayed, you've told us to pray, and you, let your will be done. Lord, even if that scares us and petrifies us, Lord. Lord, we want to pray this morning that your will will be done in our lives. Lord, you had to go away and you said to your disciples and to us that you going away will be better for us because your Holy Spirit will be left behind, Lord. We want to pray this morning, Lord, for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord. In our lives, in our decision-making, with our God-given talents, with our God-given spiritual gifts, Lord, we want to lay it at your feet this morning, Lord. Lord, we don't want to hide from you anymore, Lord. Lord, we pray that you will impress in our hearts, Lord, what it is that you want us to do, how we can serve you, Lord. Lord, help us to see the bigger picture of your upside-down kingdom, Lord. Help us to step out of this world and see what it is that you've got planned for us, Lord. Help us to not look at the temporary, but help us to look at the eternal, Lord. Lord Jesus, we are so excited about your eternal, Lord. Lord, help us to, to keep that in mind, Lord. 
Lord, help us to, when we read your, your word, to see what it is that you want us to see, Lord, and to hear what it is that you want us to hear, Lord. We don't want to be the heart of heart that don't understand, Lord. We don't just want to be like the Pharisees going through the motion. We don't want to be like the religious just following a pattern. We don't want to come to church just because it's habit or because we're trying to show our kids the right way or because we feel morally it's good. Lord, help us, Lord. Help us to be filled by your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to change, Lord. Lord, my wish would be, Lord, that we could walk in this town and without us even having to say anything people would know that we are Holy Spirit that we are different Lord help us to not even have to use words in our workplace to not even have to use words in our meetings to not even have to use words at our schools to not even have to use words Lord in our troubles in hospital next to hospital beds but if and when we do, that it would be spiritful, Lord. That it would be words that you want us to speak, Lord. Help us to encourage, to help, to serve. We ask that in your mighty name, Lord. And as we sit here, Lord, and we remember of what you did for us on that, that cross, which we sometimes still can't understand, Lord. As we sit here and remember that you have left and you are preparing a place for us that excites us so much, Lord, help us to be ready, to be ready like the virgins were ready, Lord, to have oil in our lap, Lord, to have a shining light, Lord. We ask that in your